Good afternoon. We are here to, to the session for Dimitris, Dimitrios Kirtitsis. I always get it wrong. And uh, I, I don't want to, to take much time out of by introducing him, but he's a good friend of the Institute. He has been, this is the second time here, so, uh, but we count him as a, as a very good friend of the, of the group. So uh, I don't want to add much more on that. Uh, he's at the University of Reading. He studied at Oxford, and that's it. You have the floor. Thank you. So let me just uh, say uh, that it's been uh, a real pleasure uh, attending this, uh, organizing and attending uh, uh, this workshop. And um, so I, I just want to thank everyone, everyone involved in, in it for um, the amazing job that they've done, including um, uh, the rest of the speakers. Um, and um, so what I w the, 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 the topic of, of my talk will be uh, the kind, uh, the area uh, in, uh, in which this uh, paper is situated is um, the kinds of issues that we dealt with uh, at some length uh, yesterday. So some of the things that um, I will be saying uh, will relate to some of the discussions that we've had uh, yesterday. Um, the, the, the focus of the paper um, is uh, the idea of the value of legality, and uh, as you know, the value of legality um, plays a very important role in uh, Dworkin's theory of law. So I want to I want to say a, a few things about what what role uh, the idea of legality plays um, in um, uh, interpretivism, and then I want to say some. Uh, uh, critical things about the way that Dworkin conceives of uh, fleshes out legality, and then I want to um, uh, propose a slightly different uh, understanding of, of legality and show how uh, this understanding of legality might help us with um, uh, some jurisprudential issues. So, just to be clear, um, uh, I'm I will be uh, for my entire talk take as, as a given the general interpretivist framework. So, uh, the, so the nature of my critique of, of, of Dworkin uh, will be some sort of um, uh, family squabble. Um, and uh, because it's... Uh, and it might be, it might be that... Uh, Especially because it's a uh, um, that's kind of family um, brawl uh, that it might it might attract the the criticism um, voiced yesterday uh, by Scott that we are not we are getting hung up on uh, labels uh, and we should perhaps do away with with labels uh, and the one thing that I will have to say in advance before you, as a preliminary matter, before you hear my substantive arguments in favor of uh, 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 having this, play, playing out this uh, uh, family brawl is because, um, as uh, Dworkin says in uh, Justice for Hedgehogs, um, vocabulary, uh, vocabulary should follow uh, political argument. And what I want to do is what I will offer is uh, some political argument um, in favor of uh, in favor of my conception of legality and um, against Dworkin's conception of legality. Okay, so first off, um, why do interpretivists um, care for legality? Um, so interpretivists, as a general matter, hold the view that uh, legal rights and duties are determined by the principles of political morality that best explain and justify past political decisions. And as you know, in, in Ronald Dworkin's version of interpretivism, these political principles, the, the role of these uh, mor moral principles is to uh, license the use of state coercion. And um, so, for example, uh, when we say 
that uh, you have a legal duty to pay me 50 pounds. Uh, well, we, we have, uh, you have that legal duty if past political decisions furnish a moral warrant for the states to enforce that duty. Um, now, a political community that uh, only uses its coercive force in this limited way adheres to the, the rule of law. And for Dworkin, the value of the rule of law or legality, as he often, uh, uh, as he also refers to it, is the distinctive virtue that law exemplifies when it goes well. Now, a crucial feature of legality, separately from uh, from interpretivism, separately from Dworkin, uh, 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 our common idea of uh, legality has as a crucial feature that it connects our legal rights and duties with past political decisions. To rule by law is to rule in accordance with past political decisions. And for interpretivists, this happens when our legal rights and duties are determined by the principles of political morality that best explain and justify those past political decisions. So to have our legal rights and duties thus determined is to be ruled by law. Hence. Uh, 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 the interpretivist method is a gloss uh, on the value of legality. Now, I said a moment ago that uh, in Dworkin's version of interpretivism, uh, the role of the principles of political morality um, that best explain and justify past political decisions is to license uh, state coercion. And uh, arguably the use of the coercive force of the state is controlled by courts. Uh, uh, as Dworkin puts the point in Justice for Hedgehogs, they are the bodies that, quote, direct the executive power of sheriff or police, unquote. And so it seems natural to conceive of legality as a virtue that applies characteristically to judicial decisions as opposed to other types of political decision. Indeed, Dworkin maintains that the rights and duties that comprise the content of the law, our legal rights and duties, are those that are judicially enforceable on demand. Now, what I find uh, troubling about this conception of legality is uh, what I will call its court centrism. And I want to argue against a court-centric conception of, of legality. And to do this, I will look at, um, uh, I will use as test cases, cases that um, reveal or implicate the relationship between courts and other important state institutions, such as, crucially, the legislature. I will argue that uh, when law goes well, uh, the relationship between courts and those other political institutions instantiates a value that is critical for upholding the rule of law, but a value that does not privilege judicial enforceability. So I will propose a, a different conception of legality, um, but one that is, is not so closely associated with judicial enforceability as it seems to be in uh, uh, Dworkin's work. Let me remind you, I will do all these things within uh, a general interpretivist framework. Okay, let me begin by taking a closer look at Dworkin's understanding of judicially enforceable rights and duties. Now, Dworkin thinks that uh, rights, uh, uh, legal rights and duties, um, judicially enforceable rights and duties, are a subspecies of our political rights and duties. We have other political rights and duties. We have those that are the job of uh, state institutions other than courts to implement. For instance, it may be true that according to the best theory of justice, we have a right to a minimum income, um, but presumably the demand um, for a minimum income is properly addressed to, say, the legislature. Uh, when the legislature fails to introduce a minimum income, uh, it does not flout legality, but another political value, say justice. 
Of course, once a minimum income has been legislated upon, it may be that we do have a, a judicially enforceable uh, right to it, um, and hence a legal right to it. But until that happens, the right to a minimum income remains, to use Larry Sager's terminology, judicially under-enforced. Here's another, uh, here's another example that is also crucial for my way of thinking about uh, about this issue. We also think that political actors have uh, political duties uh, that um, may not be judicially enforceable and thus fall outside the content of the law. An example of such a duty is the duty of the head of state in parliamentary systems, I don't know what's the situation in uh, uh, Mexico, to dissolve and summon parliament under certain, certain conditions only. And we think that if a head of state flouts this duty, and uh, uses this, the power to dissolve and summon Parliament to uh, promote her partisan agenda, she's committing, she because she's the Queen, uh, she's committing um, a political wrong, say because she's uh, subverting democracy. But in most uh, legal systems that I'm familiar with, uh, we don't think that this duty can be enforced by courts. Now, what explains Dworkin's focus on judicially enforceable rights and duties? Uh, here's what I take the thought to be. It seems to be that the thought seems to be that law answers a pressing moral problem that bears on the political legitimacy uh, of the state, and that's, the, the, that's a problem raised by, the, um, by its use of coercive force. It's because um, uh, uh, the state uses uh, uh, coercion, coerces uh, uh, citizens that we are faced uh, in a political community with that pressing moral problem, and law is uh, the answer to that pressing moral problem. It, law furnishes conditions uh, that make th – that. Uh, license, morally license, uh, the use of coercive, um, of the coercive force of the state. Now, this moral problem is distinct from the problems of political and institutional morality uh, to which the other political rights and duties that I mentioned are an appropriate response. So, how, how, exactly, how exactly does the law answer uh, that special and urgent moral problem. Um, in order to answer this question, uh, uh, Dworkin invokes, uh, as is well known, the idea of integrity. Uh, he says that a regime is legitimate when it directs the executive power of sheriff or police in accordance with a unified conception of political justice, and that regime, when, when uh, a regime that does that manifests the virtue of political integrity. Now, as I said, integrity is uh, Dworkin's elaboration of the value of legality. So uh, the value of, of legality just tells us that um, in order to be ruled properly by law, we have to, in order to be ruled properly, we ought to be ruled in accordance with past political decisions. And Dworkin adds to that, that um, in order to be uh, governed in accordance with past political decisions, we have to be ruled uh, in accordance with the uh, value of political integrity. So integrity gives more specific content to legality the requirement that our legal rights and duties be sensitive to past political decisions. We ought to look, according to uh, integrity, we ought to look at past political decisions to glean from them the conception of justice that we had committed to in the past so as to continue to act in accordance with it today. So, uh, the, so integrity is um, an egalitarian ideal. Integrity also explains why Adherence to legality gives a moral warrant for the exercise of state coercion. It does, because, it does so because it furnishes the benchmark for political legitimacy. It uh, 
uh, it um, expresses that um, e egalitarian ideal. So a state that complies with legality is legitimate insofar as it thereby satisfies integrity. That's Dworkin. Or, put differently, integrity explicates the conditions for the legitimate exercise of state coercion in terms of adherence to, the, to legality, that is, in adherence to past political decisions. Okay, so that's, that, was the, that, the, that was the summary of the connection between legality and integrity in uh, Dworkin's theory. Here's some problems. Here are some problems for, um, for integrity. Dworkin's choice of focus um, on uh, courts' use of uh, uh, state coercion, courts' licensing, ra rather, of state coercion, uh, presumably comes at a cost. Um, for one thing, courts committed to legality must engage in moral reasoning to identify the right principles that show our political history um, in its best light and apply, uh, apply those principles to the case at hand. Now, ever since Hercules, Dworkin's ideal judge, came onto the scene, this feature of Dworkinian interpretivism has given rise to a persistent objection among Dworkin's critics, and this objection was pressed recently by Scott Shapiro in Legality. Shapiro says that interpretivism saddles us, or saddles our courts, with an unworkable uh, judicial epistemology. Maybe uh, he argues, we can accept that when an exceptional came, case comes before them, judges will be forced to deliberate morally, and it might be okay that they deliberate, deliberate morally, but why should we think that ordinary judges um, are well-placed to do so as a matter of course? And he gives uh, a number of reasons why we might doubt that uh, they can do so competent, competently as a matter of course. Uh, let me mention a couple of them. Uh, first, you know, uh, they, they are, uh, until we merge uh, philosophy departments and law departments, they are trained in law, uh, not uh, 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 philosophy, or they're not, they specialize in, they don't specialize in philosophy. Um, the other thing that uh, Shapiro worries about is that uh, a, a judge that engages in moral reasoning uh, cannot command uh, the trust of uh, citizens. Citizens will think, uh, why should I, why should I uh, follow the judge's uh, moral judgment uh, um, on a case that comes before them, especially when that case involves uh, morally contentious uh, issues. Now, I will, I will revisit this objection towards the end of uh, the presentation uh, once I've set out my alternative to Dworkin's court-centric conception of legality. But first, let me discuss um, let me discuss a different problem that I think Dworkin's account runs into. One that has to do with the concept of integrity. W one obvious reason to doubt that integrity delivers a court-centric conception of legality is that Dworkin does not think integrity only governs judicial decision-making. So he, in Law's Empire, um, uh, he distinguishes uh, between integrity in legislation and integrity in adjudication. But given that he thinks that uh, integrity uh, applies to both uh, legislation and adjudication, it is not clear why only integrity in adjudication is a mark of uh, legality. If interpretivists use values to delineate legality, and if integrity governs the decisions of both legislators and judges, why shouldn't we treat as legal rights those that we demand from legislators as well as judges, such as, for instance, the judicially under-enforced uh, rights? Now, one might say, in response to this, um, a defendant, a, 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 a proponent of Dworkin's version of interpretivism, that when the legislature flouts integrity, it would be odd to think that it has made a legal mistake, whereas a court decision that violates adjudicative integrity would be, rightly be quashed on appeal. 
But of course, that is not an adequate answer. We wanted to know what makes something a legal mistake, um, as opposed to a different kind of mistake in political morality, and we thought integrity would be our yardstick. But now it turns out that there must be a different idea at work which distinguishes which aspect of integrity, in adjudicative integrity or legislative integrity, is relevant and which not. Um, and there's a further problem. I said a, mo a moment ago that there are some failures of legislative integrity which have to be left standing, legally speaking, uh, because they do not count as legal mistakes. Now, if courts have a standing reason to implement legislative decisions, then these failures will end up contaminating adjudicative integrity as well. In fact, this should happen quite often for the simple reason that democratic politics routinely allows a new majority to enact policies that are animated by a political platform that might be very different from the political platform of the previous majority. So how, how can we um, resolve these problems? Um, one thing we could do, the, the thing that we propose we do, is um, uh, take, a, uh, take a second look, another look at the problem of, of political legitimacy, and perhaps try to move beyond what I think we is a rather the restrictive um, um, understanding of the problem of political legitimacy uh, that Dworkin favors, um, according to which political legitimacy is a retail thing, a matter of what right you and I can claim in court. Instead, I, I propose we um, acknowledge that political legitimacy has a systemic dimension. For a regime to be legitimate, it, not, it is not sufficient that it gets it right or reasonably close to right on individual occasions, it is also important that it has standing guarantees that the power entrusted state institutions is, will not be abused. Such guarantees are meant to give assurance, uh, for one thing, they are meant to give assurance that state institutions will on the whole tend to act justly. Without such, such uh, assurances, we increase the likelihood and appeal of defection from the system. Such assurances also strengthen our disposition to comply with the law, even when it's not fully just. Given those assurances, it is not unreasonable for me to believe that even though um, the law got it wrong this time, it will not get it wrong systematically. It will get it right next time around. So, so because let me let me use um, let me use an, uh, an illustration. Um, this way of thinking about political legitimacy uh, can be gleaned from um, the way John Rawls approaches political legitimacy in uh, a theory of justice. So Rawls starts by um, developing uh, his two principles, and then he says, "Okay, so once we've we've got these principles in, uh, we've identified these principles. How can we come up with?" Um, a, an institutional ar arrangement which will deliver these principles um, over time and in a sustained way. And I think that those assurances, the, 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 the kinds of assurances that um, I've been talking about and I will talk about in a more detail in a moment, um, are features of, of that institutional arrangement that Rawls is after. We want, because we want an, an institutional arrangement that will deliver uh, justice, not on a retail basis, but over time and in a sustained way, we want to make sure that there are mechanisms in place that will not make those institutions, say, hostage to uh, uh, a tyrannical uh, faction or will reduce uh, the likelihood that uh, those institutions will misfire. Um, and because, uh, and in so far as there are these assurances in place, there's less reason for me to think to uh, uh, um, 
hedge my bets and say, hang on a second, before I comply, I must, uh, I, why should I comply if, if it turns out that uh, I would be uh, screwed over uh, systematically? Now, I, I want to propose uh, uh, for the purposes of this talk that we uh, class, class these assurances or many of these assurances under the concept of uh, separation of powers. Um, now, we think that part of what it takes for the institutional arrangement of a, a political uh, community to go well is that it is structured in accordance with the precepts of separation of powers. Now, you, I'm not... I, I, I know that, that people, some people... Um, uh, have are very sensitive about separation of powers, but let me let me say that, uh, uh, let me say up front that uh, my understanding might sound slightly idiosyncratic, but bear with me. Um, um, let's hypothesize, uh, as uh, Nikos suggested yesterday. Um, as I uh, will be using it for the for my for the purposes of today's talk. Uh, separation of powers includes a division of labor requirement and a checks and balances requirement. It tells us that courts and other in state institutions ought to work together in a joint institutional effort in which tasks are assigned to those with the right credentials to carry them out and where state institutions monitor each other's performance. Oh, good. Now, separation of powers, as I as I've just sketched it, is relevant to legality. First, it preserves legality's link between legal rights and duties and past political decisions. How is that? In a joint institutional effort of the sort that I've just um, hinted at, um, what each participant may decide on a given occasion depends on the past contributions, well, the, the contributions of all the other participants. It's a joint institutional effort. Uh, people, uh, institutions uh, work together in it. Um, and what that means, what working together means, is that I don't get to do all the work. I share the work um, with other state institutions. So what I ought to do uh, in my capacity as a judge depends also on uh, the contributions to the joint institutional efforts of my fellow participants, say, uh, legislators. So, in, in fact, the relationship between courts and the legislature is a very good uh, illustration of how the joint ins institutional effort works. Legisl legislatures depend on, rely on courts to uh, give effect to their decisions, and uh, uh, courts, on the other hand, have a standing reason to heed the acts and decisions of the legislature. So, separation of powers seems to preserve the link that we, that, in, that interpretivists need between legal rights and duties and past uh, political decisions. It also, uh, as I've already indicated, preserves the link between legality and legitimacy. The assurances that separation of powers uh, uh, provide matter for legitimacy. Why? Because uh, they, uh, they they give us confidence that the, the, that our political community will act justly. Maybe not on any given occasion, uh, but uh, it will act reasonably justice, ju justly. Not just in a retail sense, but in the systemic sense that I've just indicated is important. For also important for political legitimacy. However, separation of powers breaks the link or, and the idea of the joint institutional efforts between uh, courts and the legislature and courts and other uh, state institutions breaks the link between legality and judicial enforceability. Many of the requirements of separation of powers uh, do not need to be judicially enforceable and in some cases it would be counterproductive if they were made judicially enforceable. And I think that the duty to dissolve uh, and summon Parliament under certain conditions only uh, falls in this 
uh, category. But I think it would be a mistake to suppose that what, that what my proposal does is solely to broaden the extension of legal rights and duties. Because in this picture, in the, in, the, in the picture where courts are nested in, or our understanding of courts is nested in uh, the joint institutional uh, effort in which courts and other state institutions uh, participate, judicial enforcement changes as well. It is now seen also, it is now also understood as contributing to the systemic response that separation of power, powers furnishes to the problem of political legitimacy. Courts are there to do their part in the joint institutional efforts, yeah, which involves assisting the other participants in the exercise of, the, of, of their role. It, also, it might also involve judges acting as a check on other state institutions. So just to give you an example to illustrate that, uh, uh, that might be one way of understanding what judges, what courts are um, um, uh, uh, are doing when they're exercising powers of constitutional review. You know, one way to look at it is to say uh, when the, 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 the judges do not enforce a, um, an unconstitutional uh, statute, they are giving effect to the judicially enforceable uh, rights and duties of individuals. Another thing that they do, though, has little to do with uh, with the, the kinds of rights and duties that individuals can assert, and it has more to do with preserving the health of the joint institutional effort. We need legislatures to be, uh, uh, legislative action to be checked in, in order that um, the joint institutional effort goes well. Of course, once we expand our vision to uh, encompass other institutions that participate in this joint effort, we see that courts are merely an option for institutional design with its pros and cons. No wonder, then, that some important political rights are not judicially enforceable. It's because courts may not be particularly good at enforcing them. Besides, and that's the thing that I will say last, this reformulation of legality with its attendant shift away from judicial enforceability helps us address Shapiro's problem regarding judicial epistemology. If it is true that judges are not well equipped to deal with a certain moral question, separation of powers, and particularly its uh, division of labor requirement, recommends that they be relieved of um, uh, having to answer this moral question. Remember, it is the joint institutional effort that must inspire confidence and trust and, and thereby claim our allegiance. Judges play a significant part in this effort, but their part is not a jurisprudentially privileged one. Finally, my, pr my proposal avoids some of the problems that beset integrity. No doubt some measure of principal consistency will be a feature of a joint institutional effort aiming at justice, but since my proposal takes a wide scope view of that institutional effort, it removes some of the uh, pressure on courts to bring all institutional action under a unified scheme of justice. If it is the case that regular elections uh, of the legislature are an important feature of the joint institutional effort aiming at justice, then courts will typically have a very good reason, a reason based on democracy, to accept compromises of integrity, or what we would uh, uh, um, intuitively um, take to be compromises of integrity. And since those compromises will be licensed by uh, the joint institutional efforts governed by uh, separation of powers, they will, to some extent at least, uh, uh, command the allegiance of citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. More well, questions, comments? So Larry Sager, Nikos, and Edgar. I have a feeling I'm just repeating what you said. I just want to formulate it in a very modest way differently, and that is that um, if 
to some degree what animates um, Dworkin or someone who holds his view is a concern about the coercive authority of the state. The coercive authority of the state expresses itself at the moment of <clears throat> a judicial order to the police department. <clears throat> but the coercive order of the state is your global um, non-retail view, right? The state is there. The, the standards that are applied are being enacted by legislatures, regulated by regulators. Um, all of the state's institutions are bearing down on the output that is in this narrow sense coercive. So it seems odd that the, the that judgments tied to the coercive authority of the state should thereby single out the judiciary, which in some sense is just one end of the pipe. It's the whole state. And as, you, as in you stress, uh, its connection to legitimacy is what is at stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so um, I, I fully agree. And I'm, I, I, I didn't want to, uh, to push this argument uh, in this presentation, but this is uh, the direction in which I, I would like to take it. So um, uh, get a better grip on uh, uh, what we mean when we say that a, a state, a political community, um, uh, is, uh, exercises coercion. And it, th it seems to me that uh, it is very plausible to, to uh, conceive of the problem of state coercion in this more global, as you put it, uh, way, and I think, uh, and I think that the, the feature of um, that I've identified uh, should be um, it should be con conceived of as a feature closely related to the coercive force of the state. Uh, I, I think it's 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 uh, I think it's uh, part of that uh, of that coercive apparatus that um, I may be put in jail, but it's also part of that coercive apparatus that I'm vulnerable to be put in jail and, and, and um, uh, I, I, I'm vulnerable in a standing way to be put in place, to be put in jail uh, or to be uh, bossed around. And I think that because I'm, uh, I, because of this standing uh, threat, all the, all the more standing assurances that I've talked about are important. Can you say a bit more about compromise of integrity that you spoke about near the end? So how, that, how does that work? So, so the example that I gave earlier in the presentation is um, uh, the example of a, a new majority coming into uh, uh, power and then enacting uh, uh, laws that uh, <laughs> from the previous ones, uh, uh, or w uh, are not extending a or refuse to extend a, a benefit to a, a, a category of citizens that would have enjoyed that benefit, uh, where the first decision, the f decision of the first majority, the only one uh, standing. Why is that a compromise of integrity? Because... Uh, Why is it not the case whereby integrity now requires something else? History change, the input change. Yes. It's output changes. Why is that a compromise? So... Are, are we, I mean, my fear is that you're assuming that integrity keeps requiring what it required yesterday, before that law, such that given that the, it's, a, it's a intuitively fair that the new law have some impact, it's no longer the integrity that requires that it have that impact, it's something else. But this is uh, confused, right? So, so the, the, there must be space. There must be space uh, um, uh, within Dworkin's understanding of integrity that there m may be failures in legislative integrity, the, uh, legislature, that legislatures may fail uh, as far as integrity is concerned. So it can't be the case that uh, the, uh, just because uh, a new majority comes into power and that has changed history, uh, it has full license. Integrity gives it full license to... to okay, now, now I'm with you. But, but how is this different from what Dworkin says? 
this is what I am not... I'm no, this, I, I, I just described uh, Dworkin's understanding. So on Dworkin's understanding, Dworkin, um, on Dworkin's understanding, there's such a thing as legislative integrity. So how do we make room for that notion of legislative integrity? Well, I don't know exactly, but there must, it must be that uh, the fact that the new majority uh, has uh, come into power does not uh, uh, make the slate clean. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be there would be no space for legislative integrity. I'm still not clear about what the, what the objection is to the to the original account. Are you saying that working says that integrity prevents a new parliament from doing anything? Uh, the, no, no, it, it, it allows uh, the new parliament to do lots of things, but there must be some things that it does, does not... That can depend. Under yeah, so, so... And there are mistakes. And there, there are mistakes, but on my account, they're not... They won't count as legal mistakes, because legal mistakes are those that have to do with... Uh, the, uh, are legal mis are mistakes about what is um, judicially enforceable. Um, so, so all I'm all I'm interested in f for uh, uh, for my purposes is that there is this space. Um, now, I would like to populate this space with. Uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, a, a left-wing majority saying one thing, uh, enacting a left-wing policy, and a right-wing majority enacting uh, a right-wing policy. Um, I know. Uh, so, uh, and what I'm saying, what, what I say to this is that uh, we don't need to invoke a separate value, integrity, to um, uh, uh, to e explain the, what is permissible for the legislature to do, uh, the, the second legislature to do in this case. All we need, all the resources that we need, is uh, the fact that uh, the, the old and the new legislature um, are involved in a joint institutional effort aimed at justice and the value of democracy as a feature of that joint institutional effort. Let me just get it right. Uh, Larry wants to jump into this, and yeah. Francisco also jump into this. Okay. Just briefly on this. I mean, I, I, maybe Nikos should answer this question. I think Dworkin on integrity in legislatures is quite obscure. There's a paragraph or two in Law's Empire where he says what I think he has to say, which is that since integrity is a virtue of our political affairs generally and not just of our judicial affairs. It applies to legislatures. But then he acknowledges quickly, as you do, that democracy will significantly unseat that. And then the question is, what is left of integrity in the legislative branch? Because, you know, if you think about the checkerboard ordinance, what if, you know, what if the legislature several times over reverses itself with regard to an important detail of the right of a woman to secure an abortion? You know, is each time democracy has intervened fully and well, what's left of integrity at that point? I've always seen that problem as undermining the whole idea that there is a general political virtue called integrity at play. But if there's a way of applying it sensibly to a democratic legislature, I don't, I, I don't know of any place where Ronald does that, uh, as a matter of fact. It's pretty obscure. I'm only guessing, but I, su I suspect it's a moralized version of, a, of the idea of a conflict. So you pass a law that does one thing, and then you pass another law, which in principle is in tension with that, with that, that previous law. Same parliament, same time. Um, maybe their combined effect is determined by some kind of notion of principal consistency. I'm only guessing. It's just a moralized version of the old idea of conflict. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't know if maybe one of the points could be uh, part of the answer is what is the type of discretion, I mean, in the side of uh, the adjudication for judges and the discretion for parliaments, I mean, in the sense of 
uh, direct uh, legitimacy from voting? I don't know if, I mean, there's a part of, part of the answer there. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, so I think that uh, uh, democracy among, uh, among other values, uh, uh, which I take to be one of the values, one of the more important values structuring the, the joint institutional efforts of uh, courts and legislatures will assign more power to, uh, or as you put it, more discretion uh, to parliament than uh, than courts. So, um, but but I think that, that this is something that will uh, that that will uh, uh, appear further downstream. What? So my interest uh, in uh, tackling integrity uh, at this point in, in, uh, in this paper is solely to, um, to, to wonder whether we need to invoke uh, a separate uh, virtue, namely integrity, or whether we can do everything that we need to do uh, with the idea of uh, uh, separation of powers as offering a further elaboration of legality uh, separation of powers being a value that uh, structures, governs um, the joint institutional effort, of course, and the legislature. That, uh, that uh, joint institutional effort aiming at justice. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, my, my question has to do basically with uh, the extent to which uh, issues of political legitimacy uh, and, of course, of integrity and of legality influence uh, Dworkin's notion or concept of law. Because I, I would have thought that uh, that influence is, is, is big, is huge. And the particular question would be this. Why would, be, why would we still regard integrity and legality as, virtu as virtues, as something that the law may exhibit if, it, if everything goes well, and not as a constitutive feature of what Dworkin regarded as law it, in itself. Uh, I don't know, it's just... So, 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 uh, I don't think that um, we are in disagreement here. So, um, uh, we want to, we want to um, find uh, the principles, of, uh, as interpretivists, we want to find the principles of political morality that determine um, our rights and duties. That's a constitutive uh, question, and uh, legality just is the at the more more abstract level uh, the value that that does that. Integrity is a, a, a fleshing out of of uh, of of that value. Andrea. It's a, it's a very short question. I, um, so what you're saying is that uh, you basically respond to Shapiro's uh, concern because judges are no longer asked to come with all legal answers. But then I'm, I'm wondering whether how, how, how the, the epistemic question will play out in your new account. Uh, so is this the, re the epistemic requirement becomes a requirement about the structure? About the design, a collective requirement. What is? What, I mean, and 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 whether or not you would end up also with other type of uh, of problems uh, of epistemic problems about thinking uh, of the designers as uh, of needing an Euclidean designer to to come up with all the the correct answers. Thank you for this. It's um, so. It's unlikely that we will be able to completely block uh, moral questions from uh, uh, from the job description of a of a judge. Uh, I think that's a fantasy. But we can we can manage the uh, epistemic uh, workload of judges and other officials uh, in a way that makes it more uh, likely that. Uh, that their epistemic deficiencies will be uh, um, uh, 
um, so in, in a way that uh, counters the epistemic deficiencies, in a way that uh, uh, channels the, mor the, the moral questions to those best fit, uh, best equipped, institutionally best equipped um, uh, to, to answer them. So, so it will not, it will not, uh, so my approach will not make epistemic questions epistemic concerns go away, but it has the resources to, um, uh, to resolve them. Now, you say, so who's, gonna, who's going to resolve them? Luckily, uh, 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 we, have, we have people who do that, uh, who, who are specifically charged to do that. It's our constitutional founders. So at the most basic level, um, a, a constitution uh, sets out the division of labor uh, between um, uh, different state institutions. And what, I, what I suppose is that uh, part of what's, part of the cons some of the considerations that they um, have in mind when they design a, such a division of labor are this kind of uh, epistemic considerations. So we don't need to, so you, I, I understand your concern to be, well, hang on a second. Uh, if, if, aren't you trading one kind of difficult, intractable uh, moral question with another, namely, how, how are we going to divide the uh, epistemic labor? We, we don't have to do that all the time, right? Because we have uh, the constitutions uh, doing that uh, for us. Uh, let me let me say uh, at this point that it seems to me that um, uh, when we define the the joint institutional effort, we don't need to do so solely in syn synchronic terms. It's a, a joint institutional effort is a diachronic effort, and it includes uh, those who uh, it includes those who uh, uh, enacted the constitution. And it includes the enacting of the Constitution, right? The, the enacting of the Constitution is part of the institutional history um, uh, that our legal rights and duties depend on. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's only that you will, you will, so you will end up with a view that you have founding fathers that need to be completely Herculean because then the systemic, the system needs to give the correct answers. So it's no longer the, 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 the individual judges who give the correct answers. It's the system, the, the, social, the, the institutional structure gives the correct and the interplay between individuals in that system the one that gives the, and so then, then you end up with these Herculean founding fathers, kind of. So you move from one to the other. I, I mean, I, I'm just thinking that that's what you get at, at the end. No, I, mean, I, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a live risk. Uh, we, we are dealing with, we have to be deal, we have to deal with a very, very complex moral questions when we, uh, uh, talk about law, right? And uh, um, w so, so that's not going to go away. Uh, and I'm not s proposing that my approach will make it uh, go away. Um, all I'm saying is that uh, we don't have to do that on our own uh, and all at once. So we, ha we can do that over time and with the help of, of uh, other people. So, you know, some questions, some important questions were uh, settled by um, uh, the founding fathers, but not all cons uh, questions of constitutional import, and not all questions of epistemic division of labor were, and so, you know, we, we can do that uh, uh, as time goes by and as uh, questions arise. Well, I, I would like to push you a little bit into what you were answering to, to Andrea and maybe try to connect it with uh, Nico's point on the uh, compromise of integrity. Because yeah. I would say that uh, how, how do you try to, to, to what will work and what will be trying to say? So in the case of the judges, they are clearly making a mistakes. So again, your diachronic and synchronic justifications uh, at this point would make the previous decision was a mistake, so we change it. 
But if we start changing it every day, there's something that we will, we will, I agree, I wouldn't like to say compromise, but it's something that we are not completely getting right, so we keep going in the name of integrity. So you're not compromising integrity. And I will say that the same may be true of, uh, of the legislatures. You can, even though the, the political shift, and even in the courts, the, the, the shift in the composition of the court changes how the cases are being decided. So, so that, that, will not, that doesn't make like the, the, the that's a pathology, but that's not, I think we can avoid thinking of that oh, sure. part. And, and going back to the idea of, of, of how do you justify the decisions, and if you're shifting, and it can be going both ways, in, in, the, in the court and also in the legislature, if they're changing decisions. For instance, uh, here in Mexico, in Mexico City, they have been trying to regulate the, the, the public demonstrations. Uh, so they have been making different bills in like the different five year, years, three different legislations. So they are still, uh, so I'm not sure if they're, in the, then the compromise is, the, the, the legality is the one that has been kind of compromised, and, and not integrity. I'm sure they think integrity is, is, is the, the concept that will help you out and asking for the justification of, and keep going and finding which one is the, the right one. Okay, well, that might, that might well be true, but uh, uh, sh surely um, the story that you, you, you just told uh, depends on a uh, on a previous story whereby we identify something as a failure of integrity. So we have a, a good grasp of what integrity is, and we identify a failure of integrity, and then, as you say, uh, we need to uh, have a mechanism uh, for remedying failures of integrity, and you say, well, it's not the case that it, it has to happen tomorrow. Uh, it might, w the legislature might uh, uh, the legislative record might work itself pure uh, over time, maybe. But but my my my, my uh, disagreement was at the very first stage where we identify something as a as a failure of integrity to begin with. I'm uh, I, I, I'm skeptical that we need to invoke uh, this idea, um, especially given uh, the vagaries of um, democratic politics. Someone else? So if not the case, uh, please uh, join me in, in thanking you.